Okay, thanks guys. Um, so how many of you feel this way about CSS? Raise your hands. Okay, so we have some people that like it. Okay, how many of you feel this way? Maybe we've got a few. Okay. Kind of both. Yeah, sometimes both. Huh? <laughs> yeah. More of this? Okay. All of them. Okay. All of them, depending on what you're working on. Okay. Uh, so today we're going to talk about uh, a lot of, or a few you know, key elements of uh, CSS3, and more importantly, how they kind of work together to you know, solve problems that they may face uh, when designing things or trying to accomplish something with CSS. Uh, so, we're going to talk about shadows, gradients, transforms, transitions, animations, media queries, and nth child selectors in uh, three little mini projects that we're going to work through here. Okay. First thing here, we're going to talk about an iOS 6 style popover. And it kind of threw me off with iOS 7 uh, because it's, it's so much flatter and simpler. So, I decided just to stick with the iOS 6 style. You get more gradients, you get more other things. Uh, not that you would necessarily be doing this, but it shows a lot of uh, these principles that we can pull together. Okay, so we're going to be focusing on shadows, gradients, and transforms to create this uh, little popover. First of all, we're going to start out with just the frame that we're going to create that goes behind this popover. Um, this is going to be pretty uh, elemental here. We create a uh, popover div. We position it absolutely, set the width to whatever we want, set the background color, border radius, and this nice little frame. Then we're going to add this gradient uh, for, the, for the top. Okay, so here you see I've added uh, I've added a border so that you can uh, get that that detail before the gradient starts. That border is going to help it pop on the screen and, and just makes it look more like the native element. So I've added the border of one pixel. And then I've added this uh, background image using the CSS3 linear gradient. Uh, throughout my presentation, a lot of these, uh, these features like linear gradient and box shadow and things, you do need to prefix those with vendor prefixes. Um, so WebKit or Moz or um, MS and that kind of stuff. I'm just doing the standards version here to keep the code sample shorter but know that some of those things you do need to prefix. So. Um, so we put a little gradient at the top there. Uh, then we put a little inset shadow uh, right below that border at the top. Okay, so that adds a little bit of effect of looking like the light's shining off the edge there. So uh, this box shadow we, we added, you can have uh, a set of different shadows uh, in a series comma separated. This first one is that inset shadow for that light line at the top. The next one down is a white, uh, almost fully transparent, but a white shadow that goes right around the edge of the whole thing, which also helps it just pop on the screen. And then the third shadow there is just a drop shadow behind uh, the whole thing, which is a little hard to see here, but it's there. So the opacity is the last. Yes. So yes, in the RGBA format for colors, uh, you have the red, green, and blue channels uh, from zero to 255, and then you have uh, the alpha channel from zero to one. Okay. So how come on the background image we're using hex colors versus? Could you use the RGBA in there? Sure. As well? Yeah. So a little bit about colors in CSS. There's a lot of different formats you can use. You can use RGBA. You can use hex, you can use RGB, where you just, instead of RGBA, you put RGB and you leave off the last parameter. You can do uh, HS, I don't know if it's HSL or HSB that we support in CSS. Um, there's several different formats uh, of colors that you can use. This, I, I use RGBA typically only when I'm needing some alpha channel in there, otherwise I'll use hex. That's just a personal preference for me, so. Uh, and then there's also the named color stripe. Right? Okay, so we've got this frame. Now we're going to add the, the, the text, the content in here uh, this frame, uh, into, the, into the background frame. So we'll start out with the header and the body. So we're going to add a little bit of padding to the outer frame so that the, the padding of six pixels, that's going to push that white frame when we add it just to make sure that it's in away from the edge by that six pixels. Then we're going to add a header element. 
for that one, we're going to uh, set the height and the margin on it. We're set overflow pin. We don't want our headers to wrap wrap around. Um, well, actually, in this case, it would. Um, but we'll set the line height, the color for it. And here we're doing text shadow. So this is similar to the box shadow. If you're not familiar with the shadow property, um, let me pull in here. Um, hopefully you guys can see my mouse can see But right in here, this is color <coughs> text shadow area. The parameter list for shadows, the first, uh, first number there is the X offset. In, in whatever units you want to use. And then the second parameter is the Y offset. <coughs> uh, well, hello. I'm just going to this. How did you get the shadow under the chin? What's that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. So that's a CSS4 technique. We're going to cover that. <laughs> um, Okay, so the, the first parameter is X offset, Y offset, then the third parameter there is the amount of uh, blur that you want on the shadow, uh, and then the color. And with box shadows, there's a fourth parameter that you may have seen, which is uh, just a solid uh, overall uh, offset you can think of it. So with a box shadow, if you set that fourth parameter to one pixel, it's just going to add like a, a stroke around the whole thing, it's one pixel wider, something like that. Uh, so then, the, uh, we have the header there, now we're going to throw in that, that body uh, element with the, the white background. Uh, we want it to be, um, we set position relative on it so that if any content you put inside there, if you want to do absolute positioning in there, it's not going to be relative to the document or the, the whole pop or anything just within that content. We'll set padding on that, set the background to something almost white, a border radius on that, and then you, so you throw some text in there. And, and we've got this uh, the main body of this. Uh, the last little detail that we want to add to this, uh, that inner frame, we want to add an inset shadow there. So the easy way to do it is, is that top line there, where you just do a box shadow um, with the inset uh, keyword there, and it will put a little shadow in there, you can see, uh, in the white area. The problem with this I found, is, and this is coming from experience, I actually built this for a project we were working on, and if you had content inside that white area that was scrolling, that content would cover up that shadow. If you had, say, a, a table uh, or a list that had a, a background color that was the same thing, as it scrolled up, it would cover up the shadow and just really, really wonky. So the second solution is a way, where you, is a way you can use the after pseudo element is anyone not familiar with pseudo elements? Okay, so pseudo elements are uh, there's an after and a before element. You can think of it like putting a span uh, inside the element that's done in the CSS. You can read more about that outside of this presentation. But you can use a pseudo element, you can create a div and put a box shadow on that and have it on top of everything, and then to allow user interactions with the mouse or the, the pointer or touch to uh, pass through that, you can set this pointer events none. Uh, beware that does not work on IE 10 below. So uh, be careful with these. I'm using this on mobile devices, so you can go talk to more. Right. Okay, the last step forward we pop over here is the little carrot at the top. And this is the hardest piece. Okay, so to start out, we created a little div uh, that we position absolutely, and I left the content uh, attribute in there, which doesn't need to be there. It used to be, I originally did this as a pseudo element, but changed that. So you put in the div. Here is our first use of the transform. Uh, attribute in CSS. So this allows us to uh, translate, rotate, and scale. Uh, there are, see the bottom line there, this one we're translating it by negative 14 pixels, we're rotating it by 45 degrees. So the a lot of the sizes here, the, the height and width of this thing of 24 pixels and the translate negative 14 
That negative 14 was arrived by doing some <coughs> basic math uh, you know, with uh, you know, some trigonometry to determine you know, the distance of the, the hypotenuse of the, that little square and how far it is. And a lot of it was just playing around until it got centered and it looked right. Um, but you can use the transform uh, uh, in a lot of different ways for a lot of different situations. So what does the translate x do? So it just takes where it would normally be placed and it moves it negative 14 pixels in the x direction. And it doesn't affect the flow of anything. So basically when your page renders, it will render everything where it's supposed to be and then it will apply transforms to things without affecting the flow of anything else. Okay. So is that equivalent to doing like a lap or it it's very similar to a left, yeah. Because if you do, if you have a relative position element and you set the left, it will not affect the flow of other things as well. So yeah, it's very similar in the case of translate. So it's because with relative position to you, it doesn't, it kind of takes it out of the flow, right? So is that what this is kind of doing? Out of the it flow? doesn't take it out of the flow. It's still in the flow, and it's used to calculate where everything is. But this is applied after everything's been flowed and the position of everything else has been calculated. Okay. Uh, same with the rotation, uh, and like I said, you can do scale as well in both x and y directions. So is this a, the, the pop over carrot, is that a class that you're actually putting on a div, or is yeah. that? Okay. I'll show you at the end, I'll show you the DOM, it's just the, okay. like what it looks like in the HTML. But yeah, so this is just another, another div inside the pop over element itself. It's inside. Yeah. So, so we've got the popover and we've got the popover. So that's, you have the top negative 13 pixels there in the, in the carrot. That's what's pushing it outside the main body of the popover. So once we get that position and oriented the right way, we're gonna start styling this thing up to look uh, the way we want it to. We're gonna start with the top border on that. So we're gonna set a border of one pixel black and then we're going to set the bottom and the right border to transparent because it's been sh it's been rotated 45 degrees, so those bottom two edges are the bottom and right borders. So we set those to transparent, and those go away, and we get a nice border on the top, which is the left and top sides of that div. Now we're going to add the gradient. So we're going to use the linear gradient here as the background image, and this was really tricky and just playing around with the right colors. And I had you know, a color picker in Photoshop to get the colors I knew, the range I wanted to go to, and getting it just right was, uh, was tricky. And so you can see I'm, I'm doing two different colors. So that really light gray blue at the top uh, is that A5, A6, AD. And then it goes to a darker color. And then I actually fade out to a, uh, a different darker shade of blue and faded up to zero opacity and that just helped with the blend because I can never get it perfectly right and see a little bit of the corner of that thing um, down there and so this was a way to help us fade it out to transparent and blend a lot better with the rest of that bar. So you'll see that there's a little that white uh, whitish line there on the bottom. That is is because the gradient is being repeated, uh, just like any background image by default. When you set a background image on anything, uh, it, it tiles it, right? And so this is what's going on behind the scenes. I just kind of pulled, pulled that out a little bit. And this is what's happening. That same gradient is just being repeated. And so that's why we had uh, that little light area down there, which we don't want. So there's two ways to get rid of that. You can set the background repeat to no repeat, and it will uh, get rid of it, or you can set the background clip to content box, which is inside the padding uh, of, of the box. Uh, either of those things, the, the, re the real reason you saw it before is that it was underneath those transparent borders that we had set. Uh, so doing either of those two, two things gets rid of it, and you get the result on the bottom there where it looks really nice and you can't, you can't even tell that it's Last little bit here, that little uh, light shadow on the top of it. So we can do another uh, inset box shadow on that. Um, we 
set it in one pixel, both X and Y, because remember this thing is rotated, so uh, we want it to be shifted in uh, from that top left corner, and it's this mostly transparent white that we add in there, and then it blends nicely with the rest of that that does in there. Okay, so here's the final example. I will be posting my slides uh, so you guys can go look at this. I have a code pen there that has a whole working example of this with, with HTML and uh, the CSS and everything that you're welcome to uh, check out as well. Here's the HTML. You can see the HTML ends up being very, very simple. You have a popover div inside that. You have a popover caret, popover header, and popover body that's that got the, the content that you want inside that. So very simple uh, in the HTML, semantically meaningful, and uh, looks like what you're going for if you're going for iOS 6. Where do you put the content for the header? Right in the header div. I left out a dot 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 in there, but yeah, just inside the header is where that other hello world should be left it up. Okay. Any other questions on this before we move on to the next little mini project? Yeah. Would, it, would it be possible to kind of force the carrot in there with the pseudo? Um, yes. That's what so that's what I did before. I decided to make it its own element just for the sake of clarity in this. But originally I had just set a, a pseudo element and before element on the top over itself done all that inside there. So you did there's one less uh, HTML element you have. Well, but you said before that uh, that you used to have the popover caret as an after element. Um, it seems to me like that would make it so you wouldn't have to have that extra div in the HTML. So what was your reasoning for take, for not doing it that way? So one reason was clarity in this, in, for this presentation. The other thing that I found is really hard to position that pseudo element. Uh, if you had, say you wanted that popover to do, appear on a button that was on the very right side of your screen, you wanted to move that carrot over to be centered under that button. And in order to do that, we had to, we had added a bunch of separate classes to the popover that would be like, popover carrot right, and then we adjust the pseudo element over to where we wanted it. Whereas if you have the actual DOM element, it's a lot easier to just go in and set the position of that thing where you want. That was another Okay, our next little uh, mini project here is the animated progress bar. We're going to have this blue candy cane stripe uh, uh, progress bar here. We're going to have a gradient patterns. So we're going to take these CSS gradients uh, up to the next level here and how you can create patterns. Now we're going to have about transitions and animations. Okay, first of all, we're going to create this outer bar. This is pretty basic. We're going to create a div. <coughs> border radius, put a gradient on it. We're going to, uh, with the uh, background image, we're also going to do an inset uh, box shadow to help the edges, that top edge, <coughs> a little bit more. <coughs> then we're going to add the inner um, progress bar there. So this is just a um, floating div inside there that has a uh, border radius on the, uh, on the left side there. We've got a solid color right now, and it's also got a box shadow in that bottom end. You can't really see it here, but there's a dark uh, shadow on that bottom edge to help it also just pop a little bit like the rest of that. Now we're going to get into the stripes. Okay, so this is uh, creating patterns with uh, CSS gradients. This illustration here shows basically the, the direction we're going. If you look at the linear gradient over there in the code, you can see the first parameter we pass in there is 45 degrees. Right? So that's where we get this 45 degree angle in the illustration. Next, we're going to be working up that in percentages, setting color stops. Okay? So you have color A, B, and C. Let's say color A is the lightest of the blue colors, color B is the darkest, and color C is between. You can, you can work along there. And then the color A that I B and C is just a convenience. You can see the RGBA values that I use are 
are the same. Uh, in this case, in this case, it's just white and black, mostly transparent, which makes it easy to set the background color to whatever you want on that that bar. So it doesn't have to be blue. You can make it red or yellow or orange, whatever color candy stripe thing you want. And this gradient is just adding a little bit of white and a little bit of black to lighten and darken that color uh, across there. So the uh, what's really going on, you can see this background color that I applied here is really, really is the background color of that, but we're adding an image, a background image on top of that, which goes from mostly transparent white, then a stripe of mostly transparent black, and then a stripe of pure transparent, and then a stripe of black, and then white, and black, and transparent, and black. So, as you can see, we move along here from 0 to 30%. That first color stop goes, you don't have to specify the 0. That first color stop is going to assume you want to go from 0 to whatever that percentage is, uh, that 30% we have there. And then at the same place, we switch over to the other color, to color B at 30%. And then we go to 34% with the same color, color B. And then we switch over to transparent at 34%. You can see, you end up with, with a fair amount of code here to do this, but this is relatively small. I've seen some CSS patterns that are like <laughs> hundreds of kilobytes. That, that's kind of my question is, this, this is kind of cool for the sake of kind of learning, but if it was me, I'd probably just make a transparent image and overlay it on that sure. color. Yeah. It's, it's, it, in practice, would you, I mean, would you be better off kind of going with the simple approach? Probably. You know? Yeah, <laughs> this, is, this is more of uh, an exercise of showing you how it works. Uh, as far as practicality, it's very impractical uh, in, ex in experience. There are some cool things, and you can do kind of some flashy things. You can, you can start to animate some of these properties and do things like that. But in, uh, in reality, yeah, you could probably just go into Photoshop done a lot faster and throw it in there as a background image, but uh, at least you get an understanding of how it works here. And then, so the bottom illustration there shows once that square that you've had starts tiling, you see it just blends together this repeating patterns. Okay, so this is, we throw the stripes actually into our CSS for this progress bar, and boom, that's what it looks like. The stripes. Now we're going to talk about transitions. This one, this one's really easy. So as your your code, say maybe you're making AJAX requests and you want this thing to update periodically, and you're just setting the width on that inner bar, you don't want it to just jump along. So you want to add this transition property to have it ease from one step to the next. Okay. So all you need to add is this transition property. The first parameter there is what property you're wanting to uh, to transition. So we want the width to, to change over what length of time, 200 milliseconds, and what easing function you want to use. So there's linear, there's ease, there's ease in, ease out, there's a handful of those you can look up. Uh, but that way, anytime the width changes on that, it's going to give you this transition from where it is to, to where you want it to be. How does it know where to stop? Did you just go the full width? Or? So you're just telling it to animate width whenever it changes, but you're the one setting it. So if you started out with width 40%, and then all of a sudden you update it to say width 80%, it knows to just go from 40% oh. to 80, and it will basically animate it from where it currently is to where you're setting it. Are you setting it with JavaScript then? Yes. Sure. You can set it with JavaScript. You can set it with a class. Depends on what we're setting up, but uh, a common example would be something in JavaScript, like you're maybe querying something and you're back a uh, progress from your server and you want to update the UI. So, so next we're going to add animation. So we want this thing to be animating along to give your users the illusion that it's moving when it's really not. This is, so it's, it's, it, it is moving and it's animating. So, um, but you can add this with animations and keyframes. So the way this works, in your CSS, 
you have this keyframes. Um, I don't even know what you call those in CSS with the in the front, but, but uh, similar to your media queries, uh, a special keyword or something. But you have these keyframes, and then you give it a name of what this uh, animation is, is called. So we call this one progress bar animate, and set that to anything you want. Then inside there, you have from and to keywords. You can also use percentages. So instead of from and to, I could have put 0% and 100%. You can also have whatever percentages you want in that animation. So you can set the steps, as many steps as you want in this animation. It can be very complex things. Then to use this animation, this set of keyframes, you add the animation property in your CSS, give it the name of the, the set of keyframes you want to use, how long you want it to last, or how long you want it to take. You have the easing function, and then infinite uh, means you just want to keep repeating forever. We can specify the number of times you want to run that animation. There are also other properties, like if you want it to reverse when it gets to the end, you can bounce back and forth. There are properties to set whether or not you want it to end. Uh, when the animation is done, do you want it to stay where it was when it ended, or do you want it to jump back to where it was at the beginning? Uh, so you can look up uh, online this animation property, and there's other uh, things you can use with the basics of it. Uh, look like that. So is the 40 pixels where you can use that? Yeah, yeah, so, so that's the like size, that's the size of that background image was 40 pixels. So it's just jumping back, but it looks smooth if you want to run it. Any other questions on this? Okay. Well, that basically wraps it up. We've got a code pen here uh, for that one as well. The, the HTML there, you can see very, very simple. You have two, two divs uh, with one, the inner one you're setting the width on it to some percentage, and then we'll, we'll animate, uh, transition, and all that good stuff. Okay, third project. So we want this periodic table, and we want, as you hover over things, to get this larger version uh, and you can potentially put more information and stuff like that, but this is what we want. This little interactive periodic table uh, on our website, okay? Our main focus here is, is talking about user, user interactions uh, with, with mice specifically. Play nice with cover. Uh, you'll see what I mean in just a second. We're talking about media queries here, so uh, making this responsive and don't think I don't think I actually built a way to I did good there's so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about responsive making it uh, change based on your device uh, that you're viewing it on and then end child selectors uh, and we'll we'll do some some coloring of the table with that okay. So playing nice with hover. In this case, we, we're going to say that we already built this nice periodic table. We've already constructed the, the DOM for it. We've styled up the, the cells minus the color. We're going to get to that later. Say they're all, they're all colored the same. And we, uh, we want to, when we hover over one of these things, we're setting the, the CSS transform. We're setting the scale on it to 3, and it just blows up. and have it animated and that's already working and that's great. The problem we face here is we, we, we hover over beryllium and then we can't access lithium or hydrogen because it's behind it. And that, that element is going to be capturing all your events unless you get that little tiny edge there, but that's not what we want. We want people to hover over where the small ones are and get, get the big version. So how do we deal with that? So. I constructed the DOM specifically knowing that this would be a problem. Instead of just making each element its, a, uh, its own element, I wrapped them all in, in a, what I had here, a class cell with a wrapper element. In doing that, we're, we're allowed to put the hover on the wrapper that doesn't change size. And 
then then uh, you can do the the pointer events none that we talked about earlier. Once again, this does not work in anything less than IE 11 if you're doing with IE. So deal with that. Um, <laughs> but <coughs> by doing that, then when you hover over the cell, you see that last last point there. We're putting the hover selector on the cell, and then selecting the element, the element element inside that, and doing the transform on that, so that when it gets big, it's not blocking your your events. And that's what the corner events none does. It's, it makes it basically invisible as far as your uh, pointer events, your mouse, your set mouse touch. Okay. okay, so media queries and responsive design. So this is an example of what we might want our periodic table to look like on a phone in that upper left. When it gets really small, I've, I've just removed the uh, atomic number and the weight and the name see it's just the uh, just the symbol for the element and I've adjusted the size a little bit it's not bold I've got I got rid of some of the text shadow glowy business going on so it's easier to read on a small device uh, things like that so that's the result we want in my opinion I if you're doing responsive design, I like to do it mobile first, meaning that your design should be for a phone. Your, your stock CSS should be what you want to look like on a phone, and then you use media queries to adjust that style as you get to bigger and bigger devices. That's just a personal preference. You can do it the other way around, uh, but that's the way that I like to do it. So with mobile first, we're going through these elements, and we're going to set the small space between the elements there. We're going to hide the details when they're tiny, so we're set opacity to zero there. We still want them to affect the, the, basically the size and the flow of the elements, but we're just going to hide them at the opacity of zero. Then, media queries work with that media keyword, so at media, and then there's a handful of different things you can put in there. You can say, you can look whether or not it has a screen. You can do print only styles, so you use that with media queries. Uh, in this particular one, we're just dealing with the minimum width of, of your device that you're looking at. So, with this min width 600 pixels, it's saying we only want these styles to apply if you're looking at something that has that's at least 600 pixels wide, so 600 pixels or more. Okay, so this is going to be outside the range of phones, both portrait and landscape. This is in the realm of tablets. Um, depends on the phone. Maybe there's phones now. There's probably phones that are wide that, but uh, technically. Uh, if you use that 600 pixels inside there, we're going to put a little more space between our elements. So we're going to just set the right bottom uh, of those to two. You can look, more, look at the uh, code pen on your own to see why you're using the, the right bottom to space things out. But um, basically, it's because the, the cells, the containers for each element, uh, div, I'm using percentages to have them to scale with the where you have. So using percentages, I wanted the actual little cards that represent each element to have uh, uniform spacing around them. So. I didn't want any orders or had a margin on the containers, um, so I used absolute positioning of the, the elements, the element elements themselves. Then we're going to show show those details back, setting opacity to one. And these, so you would put this media query after all your other <coughs> um, CSS, so it, it cascades the way you're, you're used to with with CSS, um, <coughs> overriding any of those. Long as your selectors aren't fighting each other. Is the reason why you didn't do like display none for the details? The mobile first and then going to pass it instead? Uh, there, <coughs> originally, they were not positioned absolutely. 
and so it was affecting the size of them, and they changed it to the position absolute on those, and just kept the capacity. But you can do this one. And I also thought I didn't get to doing it, but you could also have them animate them if you changed them. And I thought, you're not changing from a phone to a tablet magically, so that would be totally worthless. <laughs> 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 it's like, yeah, oh, I well, did. they're fading. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Only stuff I would do. Yeah. Well, if you okay. change the the size of your browser, if you're, if you're messing with that, then you would see it. But yeah. Um, I actually did uh, with the. You said that you. I know you said you prefer to style off the phone and then make the adjustments for bigger screens. What if you are going the other direction? Would you do a max? Is there a max width? Yeah. Yeah. So there's a max width there, and you can just basically flip that around. I see. Okay. You max width, and then you start getting. Instead of here, you're going from smallest, and then you're getting larger and larger. You, if you're starting at the largest, then you go smaller and smaller. Uh, so then here we have the min width 992. So you're getting a desktop range here. Uh, we want to set the height of the, the periodic table itself. I have that also in percentages, the height of the cells. So they're all 10%. There's 10 rows there. And so setting the height to scale up those. Uh, <coughs> The individual rows, which will you know, affect the cells. Uh, we'll boost up the font size <coughs> for the details, boost up the font size for the symbol itself, and everything will scale uh, quite nicely. If you go to the, the code pen on your own, you'll, you can play around with just resizing that thing and watching it kind of jump around. <coughs> so, last thing we're talking about here is nth child. Uh, so nth child is a <coughs> selector in CSS that allows you to select some nth child or some, some element that is the nth child in its parent. <coughs> and it's not just the nth child. You can, well, I'm sure it's part of it. Um, you can think of it like the algebra problem of a times n plus b. So you can, you can put in that selector just n, which would style everything. You can put in this little table, these are some examples, you have 2n plus 1. You can think of it as, as starting n starting at 0 and just going until it's not applying to anything anymore. So if you put in 0 with the 2n plus 1, uh, you're going to get 0 plus 1 is 1. You can put in 1 for 2n plus 1. 2 times 1 is 2, plus 1 is 3, etc. You can see in this little table, so it's a way to select often used in tables to select every other row. Because you can also do, instead of the little formula there, they have keywords of even and odd that you can throw in. <coughs> That's a really common use case, right? To select even or odd if you're doing elements. But with this, you can uh, do something like what I did here, styling this table with these different colors. I want to talk about how to do that. This is kind of a contrived example. like. You'd never really do this probably. And most nth child uh, use cases I've seen are typically for even or odd, or maybe you want every fourth one selected, or different styles or something like that. So you can, you can do that quite easily uh, with, with the nth child. But I've got to have some good examples, so I can try I did. So we're going to start with uh, the selected areas here. We want to make those this uh, greener color. So we're going to uh, use the nth child selector. That first uh, first line of code there is selecting that left-hand column. So we're saying all of these cell elements that are the, the first two children. So using the negative n is a way to select the first few, you know, whatever that second number in there is. You, put in a zero, right, you're going to get two, and then if you put in a, a one, negative one plus two is going to be one, and then you go up from there and it starts getting some negative indexes, which you kind of have. So that's the typical way to select the first n number of elements in, in something is to use negative n plus the number of elements you select. So we're saying uh, the first two uh, cells inside their, their parents, and then the elements inside them. And then that second row is n plus 13. So 
basically there we're starting at the 13th and then all of the ones after that. So with those two selectors, we're able to set the background color to this green, and that's what our table looks like. Next, we want to uh, select the alkali metals and non-metals. Uh, so this, the first line there of code is simply selecting that first column. The nth child one is the first child. You could also use the uh, first child in that case. Moving on here, we're now going to have a series of, uh, we're going to just be working with that top row with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, etc. So we use the nth child on the row, so that periodic row do. We want, we want the second one of those, and then within that, we want from the 14th on, so that n plus 14 of the cells and the elements inside of that. Additionally, we'll jump down to that next row. We want the third child, right? So the next row down of, in the periodic row elements. Then we want from the 15th on. And you see the fourth row, we want the 16th on. And then the fifth row from the 17th on. You get this little stacked selection right there. So we set that to green, uh, to a slightly different shade of green. And here's yet a, another slightly different shade of green. We want to select the number of gases. So here we uh, grab the first six rows of the, the periodic rows, so the negative n plus six there, just selects our first six. And then we want just the 18th child. Selection there. Last thing we want. Yes. Question. So you're specifying the element class after the nth child. Is that because you're grabbing the other element? You could grab the elements that are not the ones. It's because because I had to wrap each element element inside the cell for the whole Please. zooming thing. Okay. So and that the background is what's is set on the element okay. element. So is this actually in the table? Or is it in no, I just have a set of divs. And it's, I originally started out with one using a table and then quickly scrapped it because it's not playing that nice is what I wanted with the responsive design. Because I wanted to set a digital on my widths and dealing with tables trying to do too much for people. And so I didn't have the control I wanted. Does the does it, does it syntax seem a little weird to you? I remember when I first started playing with and child, I was thinking that it would be like the child of that element, but it's not. It's like that element and it's like the siblings basically, right? Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, well it's, it's saying that element is the nth child of its parent. Yeah, it is a little weird. When I mean, you understand the way CSS has to parse this and, and deal with it, it makes sense. But it is, it is weird at first because you start thinking nth child, oh I'm going to select the nth child of this element, but it's, no, it's when this element is the nth child of its parent is really what you're, what you're saying. So thanks for pointing that out. So the last one here, we want to select the lanthanides and actinides. Don't know if I said that right, not a chemist. Uh, but for that, so we want the ninth and tenth rows there. So the n plus nine is just nine and beyond. Uh, and then everything inside of that, we're going to give this more Anyway, there's your, there's your periodic table. Here is the link to the code pen. And uh, once again, showing off the, uh, I also did some, if you look at the code pen, I also did some additional um, nth child work to get the corners and the edges to not blow up out, like off the screen. So when you go up to this corner, it keeps it in. Um, so instead of being centered, so bottom row there just goes up. Anyway, so you can see some of that at the code pattern. So uh, since you said you did it with divs, how does it know what row and what column? I have divs for each row. So there's the okay. there's there's a row and then all the spaces in there are also the cell divs. So there's just 18 cells inside uh, each row. And the blank ones just don't have the element 
element. So inside the cell. In your CSS, you're going to the row and then what? Yeah, because all the rows have the same number of uh, children in them, so to do that selection. And that was another reason tables, you can do a whole bunch of TDs, but you want to use cold spans and stuff like that, but it was just easier to use like this. And then you just use percentages to get the number of columns. Yeah, so the columns are like 5.55%, because that goes into 18. Um, and then there's 10, 10 rows, so they're 10%. And that way, I, you know, I was thinking, if you actually have this little periodic table widget that you wanted to throw on your site, you probably want to be able to say exactly what size you want it and put it somewhere. You know, you can, uh, any other questions? That's it. Once again, uh, my name's Alma Madsen. That's the link to, can't read it, I'll pop up the process next time. Uh, AlanMadsen.com slash dex slash advanced dash CSS3. It's not there yet. It will be, and I'll be posting that link on the SteePHP website uh, if you want to access this. Question, I guess. Um, with your code pin links, I didn't really want to get the second one to work. I'm just wondering if I probably copied it down wrong. So it's more, you know, well, I guess it. Did, I did test them all, so hopefully they're right. Uh, I know they are case sensitive. I can go back to them if you want, or if you're able to just look at this deck building. Yeah, once, once, you, once you get in there, I'll just look at it again. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any trouble with the scaling? Did that word probably rather <coughs> uh, It's except for IE. <laughs> scaling. So scaling works. Uh, I know it works in 10 and 11 of IE. It works on you know the other real browsers. Um, IE 9, I'm not sure. I didn't do a lot of really thorough testing, considering how kind of considering this was a presentation on CSS3, and so whatever supports <laughs> that stuff. You can look at, if you aren't aware of it, there's a site called Can I Use, which, which is a nice site to go and see what browsers support it. You can just type in. So, uh, property or whatever you're trying to use, and it'll tell you what supports it says. Have you found any uh, tools or editors that maybe help you visually kind of design some of this stuff? Because with the CSS3 and all the prefixes and stuff, it can be kind of overwhelming to open up, you know, no tags or anything. Sure. They just uh, sort of work these sure. cross browsers. So, as far as tools, uh, Editors, I like Sublime Text, um, but you can use whatever you know, editors I expect to use. Tools that really help me, I would really recommend using a CSS preprocessor if you're not already, like Less or Stylus or Sass. One of those, I personally prefer Less, but they're all great. Um, all my code pens are using Less, and so you can see what that looks like. When I'm doing that, I'll use any big project I have, I'll have a set of uh, mix-ins that take care of all the prefixing for me so that I don't have to worry about typing out all those prefixes. I can just put one line in, a box shadow, and it will take care of the prefixes. And then as browsers get better and better and support more of that, you can go into those, those mix-ins and remove things from them, and you don't have to go through your entire project and find and replace things. So highly recommend that. And it's, they make, I think all of them make it really easy to develop have JavaScript versions that you can just throw in your, your page and it will dynamically compile while you're working on it. And then you can run the compiler on those files before you send them out to production. So you just can static CSS files. So if you're not using one of those, highly recommend Which one was the use of you recommend you use? I use less. Less? Uh, like yeah, L-E-S-S. -E -S -S. Yeah, there's SAS, which is S-A-S-S or S-C-S-S. And there's Stylus. Uh, Stylus is a little bit newer than the other two. I haven't really played around with it much. Between SAS and Lush, there are things I like more about both of them over the other. I've just used less more, so that's probably why I would prefer it. They both have different. They're slowly converging. They seem to be kind of just sharing features here. As one introduces new features in the pop or the other one. Adopts those features too. 
Any other questions? Yeah. How did you go from mechanical engineer to front end design? It's just a hobby. I, in high school, I started playing on web technology and made a really, really terrible web page for my mom. And, <laughs> and uh, just continued that. By the time I was in college, I was uh, a year in and I got a, I got a job doing graphic design and some, some, a little bit of web stuff part-time and then a full-time offer and it just kind of went from there and I love it so stuff like that. Thank you. <laughs>